set disorders. He's a graduate of Duke, and his PhD is in clinical psychology from the University of Michigan. Scott. <clears throat> Well, thanks for the kind introduction, Paul, and in the parlance of the study you described earlier, I hope you'll find this to be a low heinousness talk today. <laughs> and I hope I can find these slides. So yeah, before I begin, I just want to thank the organizers for including me as part of this fantastic event. Um, I've learned a lot already, and it's been a real treat to listen to some of the people whose work I've admired for many years, as well as to hear from some, some rising stars in the field. Um, but I'm going to be talking about uh, assessing the impact of genetic susceptibility testing. And before I begin, I wanted to say a little bit about my background so you can know where I'm coming from. So as was mentioned, I'm a clinical psychologist by training. So for better or for worse, I'm going to be focusing a lot on individual level data. And um, a lot of my work has been in the context of adult onset conditions. So I'll talk some about Alzheimer's disease testing, but I've also done some work in direct-to-consumer genetic testing and tumor sequencing for cancer care. Um, and my talk today, I'm going to start with a brief review of some traditional approaches that the field took in the early days of assessing the psychosocial impact of genetic testing. Uh, offer some methodological critiques and uh, recommendations for future research. And uh, throughout, I think I'll be using Alzheimer's disease as hopefully an instructive case example, because that's the, the work that I know best. Um, but let's start, as Eric Jungst and others pointed out yesterday, uh, a lot of this field really began with genetic testing for Huntington's disease in the 80s and 90s. And I think it's a paradigmatic genetic testing case for uh, a variety of reasons. So uh, as you probably know, at the time, there was a lot of legitimate concern about the possibility that people might have catastrophic uh, psychological responses to learning bad news that might even uh, include suicidal responses. Um, and so I think the genetic counseling model that was developed around Huntington's disease, you know, with intensive pretest education and post-test counseling, uh, really became a model for a lot of other disorders as well. Um, but I think it also, uh, for better or for worse, became a model for research in this area on the impact of genetic testing. And I think there are some some challenges with that. So, for example, a landmark early study was Wiggins et al. in New England Journal. And the outcome measures that were used were these very general psychiatric uh, symptom checklist type uh, measures. So the Beck Depression Inventory, the Global Severity Index from the Symptom Checklist 90 measure. Um, and I'll, I'll critique those in just a little bit. But th this is the type of finding that you saw from some of these early studies. So in this uh, project, they divided um, participants by the type of test result they received. And you can see the good news was uh, none of the groups showed any kind of increase uh, in psychiatric symptoms from baseline. And in fact, um, people who got decreased and increased risk results seem to have a slight uh, decrease over time. And so um, one piece of, of good news here was maybe uh, you know, this is not quite as um, toxic as we, we feared. And it also points out that in some ways, uh, maybe uncertain results are at least uh, as challenging, if not more so, than definitive results, even if those definitive results are for a very dramatic um, negative health outcome. So this and other studies, I think, um, gave us some initial insights. So uh, as was alluded to yesterday, a lot of times, even though the focus is on how do different test results impact people differently, um, oftentimes, at least the way that outcomes were being measured, people's pretest psychological functioning were a much better predictor of those outcomes than the test result itself. And um, even though negative test results were often a cause of, of relief, uh, they weren't uh, uniformly positive results, if you will. Survivor guilt was alluded to yesterday. Um, in Huntington's specifically, I think we saw uh, people who had made decisions that they regretted. They had presumed they would test positive uh, and then uh, ended up regretting maybe some irreversible decisions they made once they found out they tested negative. But I think the big uh, picture takeaway from this early research was, again, positive test results not as toxic as we feared. Um, 
Why is this? Well, I think there's a lot of explanations for why we saw this kind of finding. If you think about the affective forecasting literature in psychology, uh, there's a concept known as the impact bias that refers to the general human tendency to overestimate the intensity and durability of reactions to negative events. So uh, not only does this occur at the individual level, but maybe we as a field were exhibiting some impact bias. And I think uh, explaining the impact bias is uh, a couple processes, one called focalism, where I think people often underestimate the degree to which other life events will you know, crowd out their response over time. People have very complicated lives that uh, go, go well beyond genetic testing. And then also, as was alluded to yesterday, um, this idea of people being able to quickly make meaning of test results, whether it's through spiritual coping, other means of narratives that people construct, um, where they integrate this test information in emotionally adaptive ways. So that's just one uh, explanation for these null findings on you know, non-toxic results. Um, and so, you know, as I mentioned, coping skills could be relevant here. And not just post-test coping skills, but I think a lot of um, participants are already starting the coping process uh, in pre-test and gearing themselves up for the possibility of bad news. Um, on the other hand, there's some other explanations for why we may not have seen any notable findings. Again, a lot of these results were uh, provided in controlled research settings where you arguably had you know, best case scenarios in terms of high quality genetic counseling provided. Um, and so that may not uh, generalize to the, the messy real world. Um, we had a lot of selection biases in research, so the most vulnerable populations may stay away from the first place. Uh, some studies screen people out at baseline if they had high levels of depression and anxiety, so uh, we need to think about those selection biases. The timing of measurement is important. Uh, sometimes uh, these scales are administered too late to defect to detect any short-term uh, distress responses. I just reviewed a paper, for example, where there was no uniform initial uh, assessment time, and uh, it was, you know, most of them were you know, two months after the event itself. So that's uh, a case where you might miss some important effects. On the other hand, we also haven't followed people over considerably long periods of time. Uh, I think most studies go out at the longest to one year post-testing, although one exception to the rule is a study from Huntington's disease that uh, looked uh, well beyond um, the, dis the initial disclosure of results and found uh, some evidence that distress might reemerge as people got closer to the likely age of onset. For example, you know, maybe that their affected parent had developed the disease. So that was often a, a meaningful period, um, but it may have occurred years after they were initially tested. Um, I think another big critique I have, though, is just the measures themselves not being sensitive enough. So I referred to the SCL90R earlier as the, you know, the primary outcome measure in the Huntington studies. Uh, when you think about the SCL90R, it's a really wide-ranging psychiatric che checklist. It's got uh, questions about somatic symptoms, psychotic symptoms, um, hostility, et cetera. So here's just a, a smattering of them here. I think if you look at these, you're probably not going to see a lot of reactions that people tend to have uh, in response to genetic risk information. Uh, if you're like me, then the uh, last one here, others not giving you proper credit for achievements, it's more likely to be in response to an NIH grant review than, uh, than genetic testing. Uh, but the point is that there's a lot of noise, I think, in some of these measures that have been used over the years uh, that maybe really dampens our ability to know, well, what's the true impact? Um, so the field pretty quickly moved beyond just using these kinds of scales. Uh, so there started to be development of measures that try to get at this concept of event-specific distress. And so the most commonly used measure in this domain for a long time uh, was the impact of event scale developed in the late 1970s. And this uh, kind of measure is anchored to, you know, what kind of symptoms have you had specifically in response to a particular event? And so the scale in the genetic testing world is anchored to you know, the experience of learning your genetic test results. And so it has a couple subscales. One focuses on intrusion symptoms, so things like nightmares or intrusive thoughts. Another subscale focuses on avoidance symptoms, numbing, uh, you know, Think, avoiding thinking about the situation. Um, and so I think this, in some ways, at least it was trying to uh, get closer to the idea of response specifically to, to genetic testing. 
But um, a lot of times the way people respond to these items, you wonder, are they truly anchoring it to the genetic test result? Sometimes uh, people respond uh, in a way that suggests these symptoms are actually more about their family experience of illness as opposed to genetic test results. And I think perhaps even more importantly, it begs the question, this was a measure that was developed in the context of PTSD research, uh, where really I think some of these uh, measures are more likely to be appropriate if someone has experienced an event like a severe car accident or sexual assault. And I think that's, we might agree that that's not often the best model to, to use when thinking about genetic testing. So I think the field has evolved, though. We've seen more focus on multidimensional approaches over time. So I think this was mentioned yesterday as, as one such uh, measure, the micro or multidimensional impact of cancer risk assessment um, that's developed in the context of breast cancer, but has been adapted for other uh, diseases as well. And so the approach here is to look at several different uh, dimensions. One is test-specific distress, but asking in a way that's not more PTSD symptoms, but just more general um, distress symptoms. Uh, there's also a subscale around the experience of uncertainty. So this could be ambiguity, not just about the genetic test result itself, but what next in terms of treatment options. And then finally, um, the field for a long time really focused just on potential negative outcomes. And so finally uh, started to recognize that people might have positive experiences in response to genetic testing, whether it's relief, whether it's a feeling of empowerment, maybe family support is mobilized in a certain way. So this positive experience subscale, I think, is important to keep in mind. So, um, but that said, I think we do suffer in the field from really a lack of consistency across studies, not only in the domains we're looking at, you can see here, this was a somewhat dated review, 2008 from Payne et al., but you can see the, the wide variety of different genetic specific outcomes that have been published on, and even within those domains, it seems like each study is using a different way of measuring. Look at all the ones there, just one single study is using the, the measures that are talked about here. So I think that poses some challenges, uh, you know, can we really compare across studies in a meaningful way? Can we pool uh, data for, for meta-analyses? Uh, I think when you have this kind of situation, it makes it more challenging. So hopefully that gives you a sense of you know, some of the, the measures that have commonly been used in the field, some of their limitations. Uh, I'm going to talk now about uh, my own work around genetic testing for Alzheimer's disease, which will hopefully provide an instructive case example for, to think about some of these issues. And for those of you who don't know, we've known since the 1990s about some very important genetic links to Alzheimer's. There are some very rare, highly penetrant mutations, uh, like the APP gene, PS1 and 2. Kind of like Huntington's disease, if you have a mutation in one of these genes, it almost inevitably caused the disease, maybe even in one's 30s or 40s. Um, but the gene that I've been most focused on in, in my career is the apolipoprotein gene uh, on chromosome 19, where if you have this E4 variant, um, it serves as an important risk factor uh, for Alzheimer's, but certainly less penetrant than the mutations I was just mentioning. And to kind of illustrate these points, you can see here, um, the, um, the rare mutations that account for maybe about 5% of, uh, if, if that much of all Alzheimer's cases, you know, they're rare, but they have huge effect sizes. The E4 risk allele, uh, much more common, but less, uh, less powerful effect. But the common uh, experience in the, in the general population is something to, to take note of. I think at least one in four people in the general population are E4 carriers. And if you have two E4 alleles, the suggestion is that it may put you at greater than 50% uh, lifetime risk of Alzheimer's. So these are, are certainly, I think, important. But you know, again, E4 is neither necessary nor sufficient to cause the disease. So APOE testing is not routinely done in clinical practice. Of course, there's a lot of other genetic risk factors we could talk about, but uh, I won't focus uh, on them today. So we've done um, a look at genetic risk assessment for Alzheimer's in the context of studies known as the REVEAL uh, trials. So we've done, I think, four of these now. Uh, I'm from the Philadelphia area, so I'm hoping we can have as many REVEAL trials as Rocky films. We'll see if that happens. Um, 
But right now, uh, we're, we're in the midst of a, of a trial, and we've done four completed trials overall. So I think the idea here is that we've looked at disclosure of APOE information delivered by genetic counselors primarily, and mostly with people who are first-degree relatives of people with Alzheimer's, so people who have an affected parent or sibling with the disease. And each of the trials has followed people over time up to one year to try to get a sense uh, of the impact of disclosing this information. Um, our most cited paper to date is probably this one that appeared in New England Journal several years ago. Uh, even though to me it's not that exciting, it kind of it reiterates the same point we've been talking about, that uh, in response to genetic risk information, we're not seeing uh, spikes in, in clinical symptoms of anxiety. But again, for the broader world out there beyond our field, I think there was this fear that uh, APOE information, because it's for a severe disease like Alzheimer's disease, was going to be psychologically harmful. Um, we've looked at a variety of outcomes, actually, over time beyond just psychological responses. Uh, I want to draw your attention to a couple of them here. So this idea of how do people appraise test results uh, that we examine some of this. And even though the fears, I think, coming into Reveal were that uh, people were going to have fatalistic views if they were E4 carriers, we found it was more common, actually, to have experiences of what we might call false reassurance. That is, people were more likely to overrate E4 negative results um, as, as lower their risk greater than it probably does as opposed to having the misconceptions about what an E4 positive result mean. We also um, try to think about ways of assessing perceived utility of testing. So a lot of studies, uh, when they ask about people's interest and how do they value testing, it's just would you want the test, yes or no, and you know, lo and behold, 98% of people say they want almost any kind of genetic information you, you ask them about. But if you use uh, a willingness to pay approach from uh, behavioral economics, I think it can, can really um, be a little bit more informative. And so we found it was surprising to us how how many people were willing, said they were willing to pay you know, thousands of dollars for this test that the medical community had decided shouldn't generally be offered in the first place. So it kind of showed this uh, disconnect between at-risk uh, relatives' views of value of the test and what the medical community thought about. Also, um, we looked at a lot of behavioral responses uh, to this information. And I think here what's interesting about some of these behavioral responses is we're often, I think, trying to think about genetic testing from a benefit-harm approach. And some of these responses, it was kind of hard to really classify, well, what would you call this response? Is it a true benefit or harm and for whom? So for example, we found across several of our studies that people who have found out they were at higher risk uh, were more likely to report some kind of long-term care insurance change which is, of course, a rational response. Uh, Alzheimer's drives a, a large proportion of long-term care. And um, so I think from the individual level, you could argue that these people, this was a beneficial information. It maybe informed their, their planning in, in a useful way. But from a societal perspective, you can imagine how this might uh, raise some concerns. Uh, the GINA legislation that protects against genetic discrimination uh, does not include long-term care insurance as a domain. And I think if this does become more commonplace, I think insurers might uh, start thinking about, should we uh, do genetic testing on, on applicants, or should we raise premiums on everybody to account for this asymmetry of information? So again, these broader social implications are raised by individual level findings. And then I was interested in this one as well. Uh, a common response that people had was to add some kind of vitamin or supplement. And of course, there have been some epidemiological studies that have suggested that potentially things like vitamin E or ginkgo might be risk reducing. You know, none of these have proven to be efficacious in prevention trials, but you know, it's pretty easy uh, to add this on. So uh, we kind of debated, well, you know, for some people, maybe this was just benign. Maybe it was positive and it gave, gave them a sense of, of control, maybe some nocebo effect going on here. Um, but again, from a broader societal perspective, I think it kind of reflects the different ways in which this fear about uh, dementia uh, might be capitalized on uh, by a largely unregulated industry that can market products uh, to, to address these fears. Although I, I bet after five straight talks now, perhaps some of you wish you had a little focus factor uh, next to you. Um, but we haven't just looked at the psychosocial, what is the psychosocial impact of information, but how does it differ by different modes of providing the information? 
So as, as many of you know, um, we have such a shortage of genetic specialists uh, in the field that we need to think about providing this information in ways other than the traditional genetic counseling model. So we've looked at can, phone disclosure versus in-person disclosure. We've looked at providing this information as part of a condensed protocol versus a more extended protocol. We've uh, tinkered some with you know, having non-genetics professionals provide this information. Um, we've generally found overall, uh, these, we've taken you know, a non-inferiority trial approach, that we haven't seen huge differences uh, in some of our key outcomes around education and psychosocial adjustment. Uh, there have been some um, variables where the in-person traditional model was superior, but not, the effect sizes were not so large that we, we felt that it was inadvisable to pursue some of these alternatives. So I think, and I think this is a, just a big picture issue for the broader field. How can we keep the essence of what is uh, very important and, and strong about genetic counseling, uh, but are trying to make it it's more scalable to broader uh, groups of the population? Uh, we also have looked at disclosing risk for Alzheimer's versus disclosing risk for Alzheimer's and heart disease at the same time, given that the E4 allele is a modest risk factor for coronary art di artery disease. Um, we found here that actually that uh, intervention that disclosed both pieces of disease risk at once was more likely to result in a variety of health behavior changes, uh, including uh, diet and exercise, which kind of runs counter to the broader genetic testing literature that suggests that it's hard to, to see changes in those kinds of outcomes after genetic risk assessment. And then uh, our most recent trial, we looked at patient versus caregiver response. So we moved beyond um, the idea of just disclosing to asymptomatic at-risk people and uh, looked at disclosing to people who had a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment, where the E4 allele predicts more rapid conversion to Alzheimer's. And so we haven't published yet from this data, but our initial sense is that actually it's the caregivers who seem more impacted by learning this information than the person with MCI, him or herself. Um, in the future, we hope again to keep thinking uh, innovatively about different outcomes of interest. Stigma has been mentioned uh, in this conference, so we, we are thinking about stigma more from kind of an interpersonal lens and this idea, will people be more likely to conceal information from others or, or perceive uh, negative judgments from, from even their, their caregivers? Um, we're also interested in gerontology. There's a lot of focus on this variable called future time perspective um, that has been linked to well-being and life goals. And so you can imagine that maybe genetic or other biomarker information might influence people's sense of you know, how many good years do they have left, and, and that might result in, in some, some uh, behavioral changes. And then the stereotype threat was mentioned earlier, um, in more in the context of, of gender and math performance, but uh, there's also some evidence of stereotype threat in the aging literature. And so um, I think it's interesting to consider how might uh, genetic information play out in this context. So this wasn't our work, it was a study out of UCSD that uh, it was an observational study where they were able to look at people who were E4 carriers who knew that status versus people who were E4 carriers but did not know that status. And so they look both at subjective and objective memory measures. Um, and you can see here, this is a frequency of forgetting scale where higher scores indicate higher levels of functioning. And so you can see that the E4 positive group that knows they're E4 positive are reporting lower um, levels of subjective memory functioning. Uh, and we get the flip on the E4 negative side where the E4 negative group that knows about it is more likely to report higher levels of subjective memory functioning. So again, a lot of limitations here given a small study and, and, and not controlled, but, but some interesting preliminary data. And uh, it was even more uh, interesting to me on the objective memory side. You can see on the E4 positive side, the E4 positive group that knows about their status uh, performs worse on this delayed recall task than the E4 group um, that did not know their status. And I think they were, even though they weren't randomized, I think they were roughly equivalent a lot of key demographic factors. So we're interested in kind of continuing to explore this idea of, of stereotype threat and its effect on potential cognitive outcomes, which is, I think, important to keep in mind because a lot of these cognitive outcomes are the primary endpoints in, in drug trials in Alzheimer's. Uh, I want to close with a section on thinking about this issue of 
How do we assess psychosocial impact within a very rapidly changing landscape, not just in research, but in genetic testing and what treatment options are available for a given disease? So I'm going to talk about genetic testing uh, that's being used now to inform prevention drug trials. I'll talk a little bit about genetic testing in combination with other biomarkers, and then I'll talk a little bit about direct-to-consumer genetic testing for Alzheimer's. So, yeah, we're in just the past few years, we're now in an age where we're seeing prevention therapies being tested in people without any manifest symptoms of dementia. So these are people who are completely asymptomatic, but uh, are identified as high risk by virtue of genetics or other biomarkers. So this is an advertisement from a study called the Generation Study, an international uh, study that was recently launched, where it's uh, only E4 homozygotes who are eligible for the trial. And so our experience in the REVEAL study has actually helped inform their approach to provide uh, genetic education and counseling uh, you know, to inform people of their status and whether or not they're eligible for the trial. And actually, this is being performed in a video conference modality, again, to try to think about expanding that reach, given that not every study site is going to have a genetic counselor. So, and this is just one of many um, prevention trials that are now underway. A lot of them do use genetics as the means to uh, enrich the sample for, for risk of Alzheimer's disease. Some of you may have heard there was a 60 Minutes piece on this uh, project in Colombia, South America, with uh, people who have the, a lot of people who have that rare autosomal dominant highly penetrant mutation that I uh, was talking about earlier. Um, but it's not just genetics that's being used to identify uh, participants for these trials. We're also seeing amyloid imaging uh, doing this as well. And so this, to me, maybe brings up this theme that, that Paul was talking about a little bit earlier about genetics versus neuroimaging information. Uh, so for those of you who don't know much about amyloid imaging, it's done via a PET scan where a radio tracer is injected into the bloodstream and then ultimately binds to amyloid plaques in the brain and can be detected in vivo where it used to be you had to wait until autopsy to see whether amyloid plaques were present. And so it's been FDA approved in cognitively impaired individuals since about 2012. And the idea here is that um, it might assist uh, clinicians in a differential diagnosis. So maybe they're, they know cognitive impairment is present. They're trying to figure out, is this Alzheimer's or some other type of dementia? And that's where the, the PET scan might be useful. But I think the future vision of the field is one, again, if any of these prevention trials uh, prove fruitful, then this might become the standard of care to identify high-risk uh, individuals. Because a lot of these therapies that are being tested are anti-amyloid agents, although there's a whole other controversy I won't get into there about whether the amyloid hypothesis is really the best way. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, I think it's interesting to think about uh, amyloid imaging versus APOE testing, and to think about it again from what might the psychological meaning of it be for people. So to compare these two, the E4 allele and, and amyloid, they're both relatively common in the general population of, of older adults. Um, but I think APOE4 is much easier to administer. You can do a simple saliva sample, whereas PET scans require a specialty facility, cost several thousand dollars. And so there's actually talk of might in the future this be done in kind of sequentially, where our initial genetic test might make it, uh, uh, might advise whether do we need the PET scan or not, because E4 does track fairly closely with amyloid status in a cognitively impaired. Uh, population. Um, they both confer increased risk of Alzheimer's. However, E4, like I mentioned, neither necessary nor sufficient to cause the disease. Amyloid is necessary. It's one of the cardinal features of Alzheimer's, but it's not sufficient on its own. So a lot of people who have amyloid plaques never go on to develop dementia. Um, Genetic information, of course, is generally static and heritable with implications for offspring. Amyloid is not that way. It's dynamic, could change over time, not heritable. And I think uh, also this was uh, alluded to earlier, the idea that um, genetics for, is an abstract concept for both, although I like the, uh, the experimental idea of showing the short versus long uh, telomeres that maybe makes it more tangible to people. Um, but I think for most people, E4 status just feels like an abstract concept, whereas amyloid can actually be visualized in the brain. People are often interested in seeing their actual scans. And so we haven't tested this out, but our thinking is that amyloid information may be more psychologically threatening uh, for that and, and other reasons. So we're, we're, we're going to be trying to test that out in our latest uh, revealed trial. Um, I also 
want to talk about this issue of direct-to-consumer genetic testing. So uh, as many of you know, 23andMe, when they kind of became back on the market in April of last year, uh, they got approval for several health risk tests. And of course, Alzheimer's and ApoE genotyping was one of those. And given that uh, 23andMe, they had a major media campaign. I think if you watched the Winter Olympics, you probably saw their ads. So we're, again, we're talking about um, many more people potentially accessing their APOE results and not necessarily expecting uh, them or not, they weren't, maybe that's not a key motivation for a lot of people, uh, but yet they're still gonna be getting this incidental information with you, if you will. And there's even now been APOE testing marketed to minors, not for Alzheimer's testing, but more for this decision of uh, should your kid play contact sports uh, E4 has been associated with worse neurological outcomes following head injury, uh, but very preliminary research. So this company has you know, gone well beyond the data to try to market it uh, to parents to, to, to make decisions for their children's um, sports activities. So even though I think this is highly irresponsible, it did have one benefit personally for me. Uh, I was interviewed by ESPN, which is probably the closest I'll ever be to realizing my high childhood dream of being on Sports Center. Um, <laughs> although I don't think they ever used the interview uh, anyway. <laughs> so I want to close with some recommendations for future research. And again, these I think mirror in a lot of ways what Chris was talking about yesterday. So again, thinking about broader issues of study design, uh, trying to be prospective rather than retrospective, thinking about uh, you know, proper comparison groups included, uh, thinking about ideally theoretically informed designs, uh, which might be from the broader health psychology literature where there's a lot of work on stress and coping theory. Uh, there are some theoretical models that specifically focus on genetic illness, like the family system genetic illness model. Um, I think we have it. We've talked a little bit about this, but I think uh, it's it's been uh, troubling how little diversity we've seen in the study populations, uh, both uh, racially, uh, SES wise, even I think geographically. So I think we can do a lot better in terms of diversity in our study samples. Um, Rachel just made a great uh, case for the importance of qualitative research. So I think we don't really see a lot of mixed methods uh, studies in this area, but I think there's certainly more room for that. Uh, I focus a lot, again, on individual level data. I think we need to think about better assessment of, of uh, families and, and peer networks in this context. I also mentioned um, the lack of harmonization of measures across studies. I think particularly when you're talking about general outcomes, not uh, you know, test specific or disease specific outcomes, um, it, it's perhaps easier to think about having common measures across studies. and. Um, but I think we can't uh, you know, not customize our assessments to the disease context. And I think hopefully the Alzheimer's piece uh, made you think about you know, what, are, what are issues that are maybe more likely to come up for a late onset disease like that without great treatment options. So I think we need to combine these more general measures with assessments that are indeed more customized to the disease context. And um, I think Barb mentioned yesterday the CSER consortium, this clinical sequencing exploratory research consortium. Um, and I think it was instructive for me to be part of that because it was, you know, it was LC researchers uh, in the mix with a lot of clinicians and genomic scientists. And even though we're very focused, I think, for important reasons on psychosocial impact, uh, to, I think to that broader world, it was not that big a deal. And it really was only important to the extent that it fed into these issues of healthcare utilization, cost effectiveness, those kinds of, of metrics. So I think we need to be wary uh, of the fact that uh, you know, in, in the, the powers that be, in this world may not have the same uh, appreciation for the importance of some of the psychosocial issues we've been talking about at this conference. So um, with that, I will close and open it up to some Q&A. I want to thank my many collaborators and appreciate your, your attention. Yes. That was great, thanks. Your picture of the ad aimed at the adolescents or the aimed at their parents uh, yeah. raised a number of questions. And I'm partly thinking about comments from Millie and others, Celeste, about sort of thinking about the social impact. Because I think that um, uh, advertising of these tests is, is a huge issue. 
Uh, and I'm wondering, for instance, with that, because it seems the FDA is potentially a gatekeeper of that. I'm wondering if you have a sense, for instance, in that, are they, do they get input? Are they interested in input? Is it how much are they beholden to industry says you want to market this to adolescents, et cetera? I don't know if you have a sense of those conversations. Yeah, I'm certainly not a, a, a policy expert, but what I do know is my sense is that the FDA um, only wants to get involved when it's going to be on a scale that perhaps has a broader public health impact. And so I think it was no surprise that when they started to crack down on 23andMe, was right on the heels of 23andMe doing a major advertising campaign and having success, I think, in, in recruiting a, a large customer base. But I think this is a more obscure company. I, I don't even know if this is that test is still even being marketed. So the FDA has such a, they're already overburdened as it is in terms of their scope of work. So I'd imagine that they might have to prioritize based on you know how, what public health impact do they see? I think that is an area where we could potentially, as a community, have some impact that might be beneficial to mm -hmm. patients, future patients, et cetera. Yeah, for sure. Really nice talk. I um, I really like that you alluded to the potential for moderators of these effects of psychological distress, and you know, identifying the people for whom this is more likely to happen, and. So I guess just a curiosity, the study you mentioned about looking at distress in caregivers of individuals with mild cognitive impairment receiving the APOE results, I know it's not done yet. I can't <laughs> wait to read it. I'm really excited, actually. But um, you know, are you looking at things? Did you measure things like social support or quality of the relationship or sort of perceived future caregiving burden? I'm just thinking about how interesting those issues are in those dyads in the Alzheimer's context in particular. Yeah, we did a little bit, but not all of what you're, you're suggesting. I think our interest is, you know, we, we looked around issues like, uh, you know, perceived concern about disease. We also were very interested in caregiver versus patient perceptions of the severity mm -hmm. of the symptoms that were already occurring. So we found some interesting um, discordance there where the, uh, the persons with MCI were, you know, rating themselves and more highly, um, and uh, I forget though if, if genetic risk information affected that relationship or not. But yeah, I think your point is well taken, and I think we that even though I mentioned it as I think an, a viable area of future research, it was not the primary outcome of our study. Uh, so I do think we can do a better job um, in the future with these kinds of issues. Thanks, Scott. Working in the same field, um, this a few comments. Number one on that one, I would imagine that the impact on caregivers had much more to do with the uh, impact on their, their children mm -hmm. and, and them thinking and focusing on that. Um, I also wanted to comment on the pleiotropic effects of these genes. Um, you know, in that you're, you're giving cardiovascular risk as well as Alzheimer's risk. I think that's important and something we shouldn't forget about with all the other genes that we're dealing with as well. Um, and I don't think the general public you know, thinks about when they are testing for a particular gene that they're going to hear about yeah. um, risk factors for other diseases. I think that's really important to educate on. Um, I also think that in giving them the cardiovascular risk, you're giving them control mm -hmm. because it is something they can change where they can't change Alzheimer's disease and that's important. Yeah. Um, and then the third thing was that the reveal study, though wonderful, um, was directed at highly educated people and we really don't know about the general public and dif different ethnic groups at this point. And with the direct-to-consumer testing, going to everybody at a very uh, low cost at this point. You know, others are, are testing without family history, without the education, and the potential effect, I think, is much greater. And certainly, we as genetic counselors are beginning to hear from those people, yeah. and some of them are totally freaking out. Yeah, yeah. Good point. So, although I guess I would also point out we've done some work around direct-to-consumer genetic testing. That's not that diverse a sample either. It does also tend to be mostly white, high SES folks. But I think you're talking about the, the way in which people find out can be much more you know, blindsided by the information. Um, back to the pleiotropy piece, I think your, your point is definitely well taken. I didn't get into this, but um, 
you know, there's, it's really complicated with ApoE because actually the E2 allele is protective against Alzheimer's risk, but poses a slightly increased risk of a certain type of hyperlipidemia. So the effects can be in opposite directions depending on the allele that you're talking about. Um, and again, in a lot of these, it's not really well worked out just how big is this effect. So we often have to, you know, couch it in these more general elevated versus lower as opposed to you know, getting specific about the magnitude of the risk. That was an excellent talk. It was a perfect encapsulation of what's going on in the Alzheimer's disease field. Um, my question would be around, so this is all geared towards, it seems, US-centric research. Mm -hmm. My question is, thinking beyond the US Alzheimer's disease cohort, thinking globally into other countries like China that see Alzheimer's disease in a very different framework, what type of work are we starting to do to look beyond our US borders or beyond a westernized way of thinking about Alzheimer's disease? in these regards, either with direct-to-consumer testing or in the research setting? I think with Alzheimer's, certainly not much at all, other than um, definitely not in China. And I think, you know, there, in the broader world of psychosocial impact of genetic information beyond Alzheimer's, there's certainly been some, some European studies. But uh, I do think these issues of cross-national, cross-cultural uh, uh, differences are important, not just uh, in terms of shaping people's, you know, maybe motivations or responses, but also the regulatory frameworks are different. I think direct-to-consumer genetic testing is completely banned in Germany for understandable <laughs> historical reasons. And so I think that's just a good example of how the, the laws may actually be very different uh, in these countries as well. But we haven't, uh, unfortunately, been able to do much work, you know, in that area. Thank you. Hi, Scott, thanks. Uh, getting back some, to some of the issues around methods, um, you mentioned the multidimensional cancer. Uh, the micro? Uh, micro? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I don't know a lot about it. So I was wondering, uh, what do you think about what their, their capacity is using that tool to identify differences that some of the other previous tools were, were not able to capture? And do you see this as being something that could easily be translated across multiple different conditions? What do you think about that process of trying to push us towards measurement tools that actually are sensitive enough to start detecting things? Because we're not doing anyone any, any good if we're just looking at things that can't see anything, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, so I think the micro, the, the advantages I see of that measure are in addition to the distress subscale, it does have a specific set of questions around uncertainty, which may or may not cause distress, but may still be important for people. Um, it also has this positive experiences subscale. So again, I think there's been a bias towards only looking at, at negative outcomes. Um, we've adapted, we use the micro as kind of a basis for the creation of our own uh, impact of genetic testing and Alzheimer's scale. Um, and I think it's also been a foundation, Barb, you mentioned yesterday this, this factor scale that Dave Veenstra at University of Washington has created uh, from the CSER consortium. So I think it's, it's kind of in the spirit of the micro, of this multidimensional approach, but trying to be more all-purpose across uh, diseases. I don't know if, Barb, you want to allow, you may know more than I do about the actual measure. It, it mimics the micro, takes cancer out of it, makes it generally relevant to a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. So it has the same, same substance. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Scott, for another terrific talk. Um, I propose that contrary to what is on